Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ellen Harrell, and I am the executive director for the Louisiana Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative. Um, we are joined today by Tara Morris, who is this way on my screen, but may not be for your screen. She is our education and outreach coordinator, as well as our intern, Bethany Morris. Um, and then we have two really awesome guests to kick off our summer webinar series that is a part of the Conservation Champions program that we are a part of with the National Wildlife Federation. Um, so we have Ted Miller, who's a dairyman in northeastern Louisiana, um, as well as Matt Jewart, who is his dairy nutritionist, who is in Pennsylvania, um, but frequently comes down to visit Ted and other uh, ranchers in the area. So they are going to talk to us today about hay and nutrition, and we are just absolutely thrilled to have you guys joining us. So thank you so much, and thank you to everyone that's on the call. Um, we'll be doing a little door prize giveaway for our live audience, so Bethany will do that at the end. Um, if you have any questions, I'm sure these guys don't mind if you want to unmute yourself to ask a question, that is more than welcome, but you guys should all be muted right now. Um, but then if you have other questions that you don't want to lose, you are welcome to type it into the chat. Um, so with that, I will let Tara go ahead and get started with some of our questions. All right. Thank you both Ted and Matt for being willing to be on this call. I'm glad to have you two together because we've interviewed you separately, but I'd really like to see the synergy between the two of you and kind of where you go with hay. Um, Ted, can you tell us about what you're doing on your farm right now for forage management and maybe the hay side of your farm? You know, we hear about the dairy side a little bit, but tell us about what's going on right now in hay. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tara, for, for having us on. I think this is a great, uh, great discussion. Um, hopefully we can we can generate some some good thoughts and uh, maybe have some good interaction back and forth on on hay production, which is yeah, which is which is a challenge sometimes. It's uh, one of those things that I think is sometimes easier said than done. We know we got to make a certain amount of hay every year, and we 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 want to get a certain amount of quality. Um, and sometimes to carry that out can sometimes be a task. But uh, but yeah, just just uh, basically a you know kind of a thousand foot view on our hay production before we get off into any more detail. Um, you know, our, our goal is to, to graze as many days of the year as we can. And we'd like to, we'd like to graze on some level, um, you know, some groups of cattle, you know, if not all groups of cattle, 365 days a year, at least some having some access to grass every day of the year. But all that being said, uh, you know, we still are in a continental climate. Um, even though we're pretty far South, we, you know, we still have a fair amount of, um, dry matter intake that forage dry matter intake that must come from stored feed so uh we're going to use those months from you know from may through august september to where we're going to take surplus pasture and we're going to procure that as a hay crop uh we make all of our our hay as baleage uh we make uh, very little if any dry hay uh, we make everything as a as an ensiled um, high moisture hay that we wrap in plastic and, and allow it to ferment. Uh, we do that to, to increase palatability, uh, digestibility, and, and ultimately we can get more dry matter intake because of that increase in palatability. Um, we, we make a, we need to make around 3,500 bales a year to, to be safe um you know to figure we can safely get through the winter that one of the tricks here in louisiana it's probably this way somewhat everywhere but we really never know when winter is going to end um you know we kind of have a pretty good idea when our hay feeding is going to start every year that's pretty predictable as we as we wade into the fall um and move into you know full hay feeding season then you know after thanksgiving um but the trick is when are we going to stop that could it be the 20th of February, or could it be the 20th of March or the 30th of March? So, so that makes a, a challenge for, you know, how much do we put up? You know, how are we, do we know we're going to be safe? Because we don't want to, we don't want to run out the 25th of February. If we've got 30 days to go, uh, because that's a bad time of year to be trying to uh, purchase hay, obviously, you know, there's not as much around the prices, you know, go high at that time and quality is usually nowhere to be found. So we try to avoid you know, getting backed into that corner if we can. 
Um, you know, so it really comes down to, uh, you know, trying to really take care of all of any surplus pasture opportunities we have. We'll, we'll hay. We don't have any designated hay ground. All of our acres are fenced and grazable. And we just simply pull paddocks out of our rotation um, and, and cut hay on them as, as surplus starts to build. And with, with a warm season grass program, it's a little bit different than what we see in the north where you'd have a big hay crop early in the year and then that kind of tails off later in the summer. We found here our, our hay surplus or our pasture surplus starts to kind of grow and build through the summer. So you know, our curve's actually, actually opposite of what it would be in the north. You know, we, we start out kind of slow cutting hay and then as we move down through June and, and even July, those surpluses build and we find ourselves you know, being able to make make those higher volumes. Um, just kind of what we've observed here in, in our system. Um, so that, that's kind of in a, in a nutshell, what, what our hay procurement model looks like. I know there's a lot more detail that we could talk about, but just to kind of give an idea. That's, that's great, Ted. And what is, um, I wanna hear from you and Matt both, what does an ideal summer of hay procurement look like for you? on your farm, ideal. And Matt, what do you consider ideal as well? Well, uh, from my perspective, and, and, and Matt's been a huge help for us in, in helping us to, um, to identify and, and, and to identify and be able to make higher quality forage. Um, that, that's really, you know, you can't, you can't manage what you can't measure, to, so to speak. And, when we were not, you know, up to a few years ago, we weren't nearly as aggressive in our forage testing of our of our stored forages, and you know, consequently, we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't know where we were on some of those digestibility levels and protein levels, and um, you know, through through a more aggressive testing has really given us a better perspective on you know when we can make the highest quality hay, and that re that's really what it comes down to. If we're going to look at an ideal um, summer of hay procurement. Um, we would want to see as much of that as possible put up ideally before the 15th of July. Uh, we're, we're making, you know, most of our hay is coming from, from warm season forages, essentially all of it's coming from warm season forages. Um, and, and that digestibility of those particular grasses is going to be highest, um, in that May through early July window. So we would like to make as much as we can there. We know that hay is gonna make more milk than, than that is those same fields cut in say August or especially September uh, when those lignin levels build and those forages. Uh, so we like to see that. Now that, that doesn't always happen. Um, Rainfall is a dictator of that, even though we're irrigating, uh, we, we're, you know, we're subject to the, to the variability of the weather. And last year was a great example. We were we had a hot July, dry July, didn't, didn't get the bales put up we needed to midsummer, and we were really kind of sweating it going into August. And uh, then we had a, del a deluge of rain here in August, which was uh, a negative from the standpoint of cutting soybeans and things like that, 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 that other people were trying to do at that time. But it did give us a lot of fall growth, um, abnormally high amount of fall growth. In fact, we, we never cut hay here in September before, and last year, we actually, the second week of September, which ha happens to be the beginning of our peak calving season, we got the privilege of putting up uh, 800 bales of hay and dropping 200 calves in one week, the second week of September. So we, we don't really look forward to doing that ever again, if we can help it, but who knows, the weather kind of dictates that. But, you know, consequently, we would... We, we put some hay up that was was lower than ideal in digestibility because it was made that late. So that's kind of what we ideally like to see and what we oftentimes really see uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to hay making. Mm. Matt, what about you? What does the ideal hay bale from Ted's farm look like and maybe some of the other dairies in Louisiana that you see? The ideal hay making weather, I mean, um, It'd be really nice if the summers would go back and forth, you know, one week of rain and then a week of dry, back and forth with that, you know, get the growth and then allow you to get the quality with that. 
Um, last year was all dry and then wet when, just like Ted said. So ideally looking at, you know, what's the best hay for stuff like milk production and average daily gain, you want the uh, less mature hay, you know, made younger, uh, that makes more milk. Uh, so you, as a much higher digestibility, the animals can get more use out of it. Uh, so they grow better and make more milk on it. Do you have um, maybe numbers of, you know, protein, TDN, those kind of numbers on, on an ideal hay bale that we could expect from the deep south of wet, I guess, of wet hay, since we're talking about the wet hay that Ted does? Yeah, wet hay, dry hay, it can be about the same. It uh, just depends on the weather to make it. It's easier to make the wet. Now, on the protein, I you can get a 15 to 16. You're doing pretty good in the south. Um, consequently, uh, the protein's not everything, but it's a good measure then of where the digestibility is going to be, too. Uh, the digestibility of the NDF fiber, uh, it's nice to see numbers up around 60. Uh, you know, when we test pastures, you know, when they're, you know, in the spring of the year before the hot kicks in, you know, we'll see up in the 70s. And you know, that really makes milk, you know, so the closer we can be to that, the more production we can get from our livestock. Now, consequently, if we make it after a long rainy spell and the stuff gets very mature, um, and you get down into around the low 40s, maybe even the upper 30s thirties on digestibility. That's barely enough to sustain uh, an adult animal just for their maintenance needs. So they're really not going to produce, you know, gain or milk. Very interesting. Does anybody have any questions along those lines at this point? Yeah, I got a question for Ted. Uh, is that just Bermuda grass fields you have? For, are you putting up for forage wet or are you using bahia with it? Because you can't really keep bahia out of Bermuda fields. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, and I didn't clarify that. Um, yeah, the, our, our, uh, our underlying warm season summer perennial is, is going to be uh, improved Bermuda grass. Uh, particularly Russell Bermuda is what, we, what we've sprigged most of. And that's what, that's what our that's what our pastures are almost all uh, currently. Uh, we have a few that we've not gotten converted over that from the days of trying to grow f uh, fescue here, the cool season perennial, and we found that doesn't work, and that's a whole other webinar. Uh, but we've been in the process of getting converted over to, to Bermuda. Um, now, along with that, and, you know, as Matt was talking about digestibility and, and different forages, you know, and different stages of maturity that, that bring different levels of that, it's really interesting down down here um summer annuals especially with some water uh grow very robustly voluntarily um and and they are they're going to be a lot better than bermuda grass um in especially digestibility and protein as well generally uh, so we like to see summer annuals um crabgrass johnson grass uh, barnyard grass, everything that everybody else is trying to kill, pretty much. We like to see in in on our Bermuda grass fields because we're not we're not selling pure Bermuda grass horse hay or anything like that. We're we want we want a bale made up of dig highly digestible forage. We don't care what it is as long as it's high quality like that. And the, and the summer animals really bring that in. Uh, to answer your question on the bay grass, um, when we got started here. Uh, you know, most of our farm is converted from um, a long history of row crop land. So we didn't have the hay grass in place initially. A little bit has, has crept in. Um, there's, there's very little bahia in any of our mixes. And we're not aggressively trying to keep it out. Um, but we do control it pretty effectively when we spray for broadleafs, uh, broadleaf weeds in the summertime. We use a product by the name of Escort. Um, which not only takes out broadleaves, but also kills the hay grass. 
uh, you know, we're not going after the behay grass, necessarily trying to knock it all out, but the, the, the methodology of our broadleaf control uh, by default, you know, does work on the behay too. So there's, so there's very little behay in our, in our mixes um, because of that. All right, thank you. Anyone else? We do have more questions. We'll continue on. Um, okay, guys, um, how many hours and dollars does it really take to get hay done? You know, I, with the wet hay, I know that's not for everybody because it is a very equipment heavy investment to get started. Tell us about, you know, how many hours and dollars does it really take to get done and how does that translate to your grain supplementation in the wintertime? That's a really good question. Um, it takes more dollars and hours than what we want to think it does. Uh, I guess is the short answer to that. Um, you know, you think that oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut all my own hay because that's the cheaper way to go, and it and it probably is, but it's it's still extremely expensive when you when you put the numbers to it. Um, just comparing, you know, when we're talking about, you know dollars per pound of dry matter and you know let's talk you know high quality dry matter like milk cow feed you know you got you got winter grazing um like like matt mentioned there pastures that are early in the year which are phenomenal in quality and we've not spent any money to harvest them you know we're we're harvesting them with cattle we did we it did cost us something to plant them because they're an annual um but you look at the level of quality the cost we have in it the fact it's cow harvested, it's extremely um, lucrative when you compare it to other feed sources, which would be purchased in grain. And then, you know, what we're talking about today, um, you know, procured hay. Um, so when we, you know, when we move over to the hay side, um, I, I ran a few numbers here this morning in, in preparation for our discussion, you know, without getting off in the weeds on details and stuff, um, you know, I looked at, you know, what's our cost, what's our cash cost to per bale to, to cut hay and bale hay. And, and then I also brought the depreciation side of that in, which is a, you know, which is a big one uh, with where these machinery costs and stuff are going, um, you know, and this is assuming we're going to make, you know, we're going to make 3,500 bales uh, per year. Uh, but we're looking at, you know, we're, we're looking at, uh, like labor, labor, fuel, net wrap, plastic, um, you know, we're in that 12 to $13, just annual cash costs easy. Um, but then you bring the depreciation in on it, um, you know, and the equipment that we're using to do that, um, you know, we're, we're easily another $20 a bale. So, you know, we're we're $35 a bale in, in real cash cost, you know, when you include depreciation in it. And that's, that's making that number of bales. I mean, if we, if we drop that by a thousand or whatever, it would, you know, the depreciation would soar that much higher. Um, so it's an expensive undertaking. And because of that, we, we really try to graze everything we can um, and, and only make what we have to make to, you know, because we know we have to make a certain amount. Um, you know, time wise, um, you know, which I, I converted some of that to, to, you know, to labor dollars, you know, I figure on the labor side, we got, you know, we probably have $2 and 50 cents a bale in, you know, in, in our hay, just on the labor side. Um, we've, we've tried to, we've tried to become as efficient as we can, um, you know, with, from a volume standpoint, and that seems to be a, a slippery slope that you just can't, uh, when you start down that, it just, you know, you, you never really figure it out. I mean, as soon as you, as soon as you get more cutting capability, you need more bailing capability, then you need more hauling capability. And it's just this vicious circle that never ends. But so you got to kind of have to figure like, okay, for the number of bales I'm making per year, you know, what's, what's reasonable for me and for the labor that I have, because the bigger equipment and the more equipment you get, the more people you have to have. And it, and you just kind of have to, try to keep all that reined in and not let it get, get out of control. I think, you know, we've been, we've been fooling with this for years. It feels like, and it, you know, I, I think we've kind of come down to a, where we're probably optimally efficient. Um, 
we did start, we, we got a slaughter the other year, which, which left, you know, lets us, you know, cut a 16 foot swath down and we lay it down in the exact windrow width for the baler. So we don't rake anything. We just lay it down and let it wilt, uh, you know, for, for about, you know, 18 hours, something like that. And then we'll direct bale it. Um, you know, so we're running the swather, running two balers. Um, and then we have a pickup wagon and a wrapper. Um, you know, so you have all those, those components um going there but it, it lets us it lets us move fairly quickly that model lets us do about you know ideally if we if, if we had good weather and plenty of acres in front of us you know that model would let you do about 200 bales a day pretty comfortably with you know with like three guys um doesn't always work that way because you don't always have that much to do at one time especially with a with a grazing model you're just kind of picking and choosing here and there um you know so <clears throat> I, I, I hope that somewhat answered the question. We we try to we try to fit the machinery to match the labor we have. We can figure we have about three people that time of year that we can really devote to that process. So we try to have our equipment matched up to that. But um, but it's expensive, and if I could figure out a way not to do it, I sure would. But we're stuck there. What are we gonna do? <clears throat> And Matt, you mentioned earlier that the nutrition level on the dry hay and the wet hay tend to be pretty what and what? Is that true? Is that what you said? They Did can I hear be you about the same, but you have way more risk of getting lower quality with dry hay because of the weather. You, it's easier to make um, the wet bales, you know, when there's a storm coming and humidity, you don't have to get the hay dry, dry. So there's you know for the the price of the wrapper and the plastic you know that's basically will give you higher quality on average than dry hay because of you know that you know more mature risk with the weather so they offset each other basically that's what i was wondering economically do those really offset each other as far as the initial cost of getting your equipment and adding adding that feature they, they really should, and it probably really leans towards the wet bales as, you know, the cost of our food supplies increasing. You know, there's there's always that added dollar there, so average daily gain is going to be worth more. Um, someday milk will be worth more than it is to the farm level, but, you know. Yeah. Matt, what are some of the common mistakes you see people making or capable of making in the new baling world? Nutritionally, so I guess. One to from really watch out for on making the wet hay. Uh, if you're raking or merging the hay together, anything you know that you're running like a pickup head on. Um, if you're bring, if you're scraping the ground and bringing soil into the, you know these wet wrap bales, uh, you run a high risk of um, getting botulism or the Clostridium bacteria in these bales and get a bad fermentation. Um, you'll definitely have a high ash content, which will reduce uh, the intake of the animals on the hay. So that is the biggest thing to watch out for, for those that aren't used to that. Interesting. Ted, what about you? What are some of the, maybe what are the, some of the mistakes you've seen done on this? What are some of your biggest disasters you've seen done on your farm? uh yeah we've we've caused a few uh over over the years for sure um but yeah to to matt's point there on the rake and we used to uh we used to wheel rake two nine foot rows together um we were a little more efficient with our bailing because we were putting a little bit more material through the through the head at one time but with that wheel rake we were definitely um bringing ash in more than we should have been. Um, and one thing that really kind of multiplies that problem for us is we we unroll all of our hay and feed it on these paddocks in the wintertime, um, you know, when they're designated feeding paddocks. So any any refused hay or, or hay that was not consumed is still decomposing there and the wheel rake would really pick that up bad. Um, so that was, 
we didn't see health problems from that, but I do know we we took up a lot of valuable space in the bale uh, with non-digestible material, which you know which put serious you know production drag on the uh, you know on the animal. Uh, so I'm I'm glad we were able to move past that. Um, you know, probably just to kind of circle back a little bit on the question on the wet hay versus dry hay. Um, you know. I have some, I kind of have some biased opinions, especially coming from up north at one time to this area, you know, and, and, and Matt can attest to this. He, he's in that area right now. And, you know, when we would try to, if we were trying to make hay in a day, even baleage, we had to work pretty hard to do it because we just didn't get the heat units um, in the weather and the, the opportunity to get that done in a day. And I mean, it's a slam dunk here. It's just, you know, you, you cut Bermuda grass at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you know, if you're not bailing it at nine thirty, ten o'clock the next morning, you're you just uh, I don't know. You, there's no excuse for it. you can you can be bailing it right away the next. Day. So it really really eliminates that rain threat. Um, you know, and, and the, the the question I get a lot of times, people say I can't afford all the additional equipment. Well, there's really not that much additional equipment to it besides a wrapper. Um, and our wrapper happens to be our lowest depreciable piece of equipment of all of our hay equipment. We're still using the same wrapper. Uh, it's a 1997 model Anderson that I bought in 2002 for 10,000 bucks, and we're still using it today. I mean, it's had it's put, I don't know how many thousands of bales through that thing. Now, we do need to replace it, but it is when we compare it to like the depreciation schedule on a baler. Uh, especially, um, it it's, it costs us a lot less money than the balers do. And when you're if you're out buying a baler, if you're going to be buying a new baler, um, the price difference from a silage baler to a conventional baler is very very minimal. Um, you know, so you know it's not like you have to spend twice as much on a baler to be able to make wet hay. Um, they're they're essentially the same. You just need wrapping capability. Um, and there's more used wrappers on the market than there used to be so that, you know, that, I think that, that, I think it's feasible now, you know, when we, and I don't want to jump ahead in our conversation, um, you know, I don't know if we're going to talk about feasibility of hay making, you know, for different sizes of production models. Um, but, I, you know, there, there's, there's a fair amount of custom hay making here for smaller producers, which I think is wise. I think it's a good way to go about it. I just, I really wish there would be um, some some custom guys set up to make baleage for people. That's what we're missing here, uh, because the you know the guy with you know fifty or hundred mama cows um, could really benefit from baleage too. But it's a little little steeper climb for him because of you know just the um, you know just that depreciation schedule on that equipment. Um, you know, so if, if that was, I'd love to see that become a service here. Um, you know, from a custom standpoint. Mm -hmm. What about, you know, if people are not hay producers, if they're trying to buy hay, tell us some tips. Uh, maybe Matt, can you speak to that as far as maybe from a, a family milk cow or the, the small goat dairies and people who have backyard operations, how can we look at hey what should people look for it on a very basic beginner level how can we know what we're getting all right so there's a couple of easy things to to see in hay um you can see seed heads real easy you know uh, the grass heads uh from like they're very visible you just take them so the the more heads you see in there uh the more mature it is, uh, the more leaves you see versus stems, uh, that'll be a higher quality, uh, more digestibility. Um, if you see any of the legumes like the clovers or alfalfas or something like that, that'll tend to increase the quality as well. Um, but there's uh, a test that the blind people can even use. It's the field test. The um, the coarser and, and uh, scratchier it is, uh, the less digestible it is. The softer it is, the more digestible it is. 
So those can't really tell by color. Uh, that's a myth. Uh, sun bleach doesn't really affect the digestibilities or protein, uh, but it does change the color. And you had mentioned, one of you mentioned testing. Where can you get the testing done? Uh, there's, there's a handful of good labs out there. Um, the one that I use and the lab that brought me to the South was uh, Cumberland Valley Analytical Services out of Pennsylvania. Uh, they're very, very commonly used across the world. Cumberland Valley, you said? Yep. And exactly how would you send a sample of your, hey, do you, how much do you have to send? How much does it cost approximately? You know, how much, is it really worth it? Uh, so the cost uh, I'm paying right now thirty three seventy five a sample. And I, that's an NIR sample that will give you the digestibility of the fiber. Uh, it'll also give you on the wet bills the fermentation numbers. So it gives you a real broad, fairly accurate uh, amount of the nutrients. Um, the size that you need uh, for hay. It's really only need about a full cup worth. The sample bags they give us are a quart. And they, they got way more than they need out of that. Uh, Cumberland Valley's um, website is www.foragelab.com. Uh, uh, all of the uh, information on where to send stuff is there and techniques and such. And now what time of year do you recommend testing? Hey, do you do that like right as soon as you're, you know, cutting it or do you do it when you're about to start feeding it? When small and larger producers, when do you test your hay? Well, on the dry hay, you can test that immediately. On the baleage, you do tend to want to wait a month to get it fully cured. Um, the numbers will change on that some. Um, like uh, at Ted's place, you know, we actually took it samples last year in two parts, you know, because he was ready to freshen those cows before he had all this hay made. Uh, and so we identified all of his earlier hay there and most of it was top quality. Um, and then uh, the later hay, we tested some of that, you know, made and it was definitely lower quality. Um, you know, in the year prior, you know, before he started calving, I think it was in August, we tested it all, we tested every, all the hay. So it depends on the year. Nice. Okay. Um, Ted, we have a question from David LeMay. He asked, have you noticed a time of day that's noticeably better to be cutting hay day or night? Well, um, yeah, we, we've played around with that some, you know, cause I've, I've heard that said too, that, you know, ideally you want to cut that hay, um, you know, second half of the afternoon when that, when that sugar level, you know, in, in the leaves may be the highest. And that makes, seems to make a lot of sense. Um, so we, you know, we've tried to, to kind of lean toward that, you know, ideally, I guess if, if, if all other constraints were out in, in a perfect world, we, you know, we would cut, we would cut from, you know, two to five every day and bail that same hay up the next morning, you know, from 10 to one, and be back on the cutter at two o'clock. Um, doesn't usually work that way, but uh, but but that would be great. We we haven't seen definitive numbers that really support that, um, y you know, real clearly. So we, we we don't look at that as necessarily the gospel for us. Um, you know, we we will cut hay before lunch. Um, you know those types of things so we we don't uh we don't weigh that extremely heavily um you know it's more more from a logistic we would let logistics rule as far as you know if we need to get that down here before lunch so we can be getting on something else you know later in the day we, we won't uh you know we won't avoid doing that but uh but it does seem like you know i i think it can't hurt probably to try to you know try to cut you know after that that haze that, you know, has stood as long in the sun as it could, you know, that grass has stood as long as it could in the sun. 
Um, I don't know, Matt, you might have, you have some numbers on that or have you seen anything on that? I agree completely. You know, sometime, you know, you know, after noon time, there's, you know, somewhere in there is when it peaks out on its sugar content. The big thing I tell uh, guys, particularly up north, and haven't seen too many of these in the south, um, is not to mow hay on a cloudy day. Cloudy days do not have sugar content. And particularly in the baleage world, um, low sugar content has a high risk of uh, the butyric acid and the clostridium problems in the bales. So high sugar content, uh, mow it off when the sun is shining. Mm -hmm. If it happens to get rain on, it's nowhere near the loss as it was mowing it on the cloudy day. Did not know that. Yeah, that little tidbit of info has really saved some problem uh, uh, silage crops of uh, like ryegrass and alfalfas even. You just we just don't see it when they listen to that advice. You know, it, they can put it up really wet and it doesn't go bad. Hmm. And I'm assuming that translates into grazing too. On a cloudy day, you're getting less nutrients on a grazing day on a cloudy day. It does, yeah. But they still need to eat. So, I mean, it's not going to have quite the, the milk that day or the gain. Yeah, we see that happen. Uh, you know, if we get a cloudy stretch, um, you know, and, and we're grazing and, and uh, you know, we've had a kind of a stretch of weather where the, the sun hasn't been real predominant, it, it, it shows up starkly in the bulk tank. Mm -hmm. So Ted, you mentioned two things earlier. One, you don't have any designated hay pastures and two, you unroll your hay. Why do you do those two things? We do those things primarily from the standpoint of, of, uh, of nutrient cycle management. You know, in other words, um, you know, the thing that we oftentimes forget when we're talking about hay procurement and, and feeding and you know, not only are we moving around digestible nutrients for these cattle, we're, we're probably equally, or maybe in some cases more so, moving around soil nutrient amendments, um, you know, N, P, and K, and, and uh, these types of things. So we want to be very careful uh, when we're taking a hay crop off that those nutrients that we're aggressively removing, because when you compare, you know, cutting hay, to, you know, say cutting a grain crop, uh, you know, where there's so much of the plant that remains in the field, not the case with hay, you take, you're taking everything off. Uh, all those soil nutrients that, that went up into that plant are removed from that particular acre. Uh, so if we would just continually cut that acre for hay um, and not bring animals back in there or feed that hay back in there, those soil amendments are all going to need to be bought in the form of commercial fertilizer. And there's, there's no economic path to success doing that. Um, so we're not going to do it. So, you know, the unrolling is a way to give us flexibility. We can feed hay, you know, literally anywhere on the farm, you know, we'll designate different rotations, different winters for, are hay feeding. Um, and then we'll, we'll treat them a little bit differently coming into the spring. We usually overseed them with a spring um, planting of ryegrass in early February, and they end up kind of being a delayed um, maturing grass crop in the spring, which, which prolongs that, that digestibility uh, because the spring plant of ryegrass tends to mature later. But, um, you know, so it's all integrated into the whole management picture uh but nutrient cycling is is the reason for that we want to make sure that we're we keep all that integrated um especially in the with with feeding dairy cattle on pasture which are heavily grain supplemented um so we're bringing a lot of nutrients onto the farm in the form of purchased grain which most of it goes out the back end of the cow so we want that uh we want to be depositing them very strategically so we that's another reason we kind of 
kind of try to keep ourselves mobile as far as how and where we feed. Um, but I think that's, I think that's a critical deal. I think we need, really need to be paying attention to that. And sometimes it's, it, it's, it's not practical to do that. If our hay ground is not where our cattle are, obviously that, that makes that a challenge, but, uh, but if you can get a cattle onto where you cut hay, it's a big plus. <clears throat> Ted, I know we, we talked about it on a practical level, just kind of breaking it down. You talked about there's kind of a cycle that you run through on your hay ground and then grazing ground. What is that order that you do things in? You mean as far as like what acres we would designate for hay or how we decide how to do that? Um, yeah, it's just so unusual to hear about this. So I want to delve in more because most people will just designate, here's my hay pasture, period. Right. So, so what we, you know, like, and it's kind of hard to describe without, you know, without being able to kind of see it on a map, but, you know, our main grazing platform where the, where the milk cows are and some other groups graze there too. Um, you know, there's about 65 paddocks or so there, and we're going to have, um, you know, we're going to have the milking herd set up on, you know, maybe like a, just say a 28 day round. Uh, grazing round on there and maybe even in the spring you might have red heifers following them kind of in a follower right so you got these two groups that are on the same 28 day round and you're and you're starting you know at green up you're going to start into that you're going to you're going to work that round and work that grazing wedge well as you know those grass growth rates change you know daily as you move through the spring and soil temperatures come up uh, you know and that's going to you know, for a period of time, you're going to be maybe a little short on grass or be struggling to get enough dry matter through that rotation. Then all of a sudden it's going to be adequate. And then all of a sudden it's going to be surplus. And that's kind of where we are right now. Um, in fact, we're, we're cutting some right now that we, we pulled like 60 acres out of our rotation. Um, that just the other day we decided we're just going to, we're just going to skip these fields and move on because our 28 day round, if we just held to that, we'd be you know, we'd be building too much surplus forage, maturity levels would be getting too high and that digestibility would be fall rapidly falling. Um, so we, we're pulling some acres out, we're gonna cut them and we're just gonna keep on going with the rotation. And, as, as, and, a, and it's such a dynamic thing this time of year because growth rates are, are changing rapidly. And, and uh, you, you know, you'll see, it'll just kind of, as you're watching everything down, you'll see, okay, we, well, here's another 30 acres that we can't get to this. So next week, this is coming out. Looks like we have a weather window. We're going to grab this next. And we just kind of keep, keep grabbing paddocks. You know, we try not to keep pulling the same paddocks out. Obviously, when you pull one out and hay it, you're going to have a lot of young growth coming back in there. So that's going to be, you know, pretty good grazing in another 21 days or so. Um, and the other thing we try to do when we are cutting those is we try to cut as high as we can. Um, we like to cut, you know, four and a half, five inches tall. Uh, because we really want, when we get done in there, we want that field to still be green. You know, if you cut that hay crop and that, and your stubble is still green and vegetative, it means you have a lot of energy reserve in those leaves. Um, and your regrowth rate will be tremendously faster than if you scalp it to the ground. Uh, so we try to implement that, that management practice too. It, it's a little bit more uh, closer to simulating the grazing, you know, where we would leave higher residuals. Uh, which allow for that rapid uh, rapid regrowth because we don't want to we don't want to knock that paddock out to where it's set back for sixty days. You know we want it. We, we'd ideally like to see it come back in the rotation in you know in three to four weeks. So we try to you know we try to leave some residual there. So will one paddock get paid more than once a year? Uh, yeah, they, they could, they could, we try to, we try to keep that as even as we can, um, you know, because we got to keep in mind, the more we hay that, the more nutrients we're pulling out of there. And if we don't have the opportunity to, you know, to feed there as heavy as we'd need to, we could have a net loss of, uh, you know, of, of soil nutrients coming out of that area. So we try to keep that, you know, as, as even as we can, um, you know, across the board, but if we kind of start into that rotation and, and you're kind of grabbing, you know, different, different paddocks as you're moving through the summer, um, you know, generally speaking, if you're paying attention to it a little bit, you can pretty much not have to go back and, you know, and, and hay anything 
definitely more than twice. And a lot of times you don't have to have them twice. Um, but then you get on down toward the summer and your bail counts running behind and all of a sudden you're, you're going to cut anything that's there, you know, type of thing, uh, which we kind of got into a little bit last year, but, uh, but mostly you can, you can kind of manage that to be even. And Ted, you may have said this already, but you're, you're also feeding those hay bales back on the hay pasture. Is that kind of a rule of thumb? Or is there a structure right. as well where you're picking where you feed? It is, yeah. We would call we would consider that a rule of thumb. We we definitely don't want to anything that we're haying this summer. We sure would like to to see it, you know, in in the feeding rotation as a feeding paddock the following winter. Uh, so we're we're returning those nutrients, um, you know, just just to keep that just to keep that. Uh, you know that net nutrient move out of there, and, and we we unroll, which which gives us the flexibility. We can you know we can feed in any paddock um, that we have designated for feeding, and we feed across that entire paddock, meaning the cattle line up you know across the whole thing. It's not like they're eating around one wagon or anything like that um, to try to get those nutrients. We, we want those nutrients fence row to fence row. We they're too valuable to to put in a pile anywhere. We need to distribute them so. Those are the tools we use to really, you know, the unrolling is a key benefit for us. Doesn't work for everybody, but but in in a in a pasture model, it sure is uh, sure is an option you want to look at. Matt, I know you work mostly with um, you know kind of unconventional dairies in the deep south, from what I understand and what I've heard from you. Do you see a difference there? Do you what are your pros and cons to this model of, of doing hay on different paddocks versus just having a dedicated hay field. Have you seen other dairy farms that are doing it differently and maybe have a compare and contrast there? Uh, Ted by far seems to be the most advanced on this grazing uh, stuff here with the bale and wrappers and the, the baleage and all from what I see in the South. Uh, there's definitely some baleage out across, you know, over to Florida. Uh, Yeah, I don't really see it. I don't really see that anywhere else, per se. I mean, there's there's others out there. A lot of the other Louisiana guys that I work with are organic, and they're uh, doing more silage crops, ryegrass and corn silage silages. And what do you think are the barriers for people not implementing these types of practices? I think they're kind of stuck in their ways of the way they've always done it, really. Um, and there is that investment to, to change uh, as, a, as opposed to this is what they've had as far as a baler and, and equipment, and they just keep repairing on it as opposed to replacing with something modern, new style. That makes a lot of sense. Ellen, do you think it's time? Anybody have questions? Maybe it's time for us to do our drawing for the, um, for the door prizes. I believe we have a t-shirt for a drawing. For our lot, I think you have to be on the call actually for the drawing. And then I believe we have a pair of pliers as well. Nice pair of side cutters. Did you give me clearance? Yes, you're good to go. Congratulations, Stephanie. I will. Oh, I actually don't see Stephanie on the call anymore. Let's do one more, Bethany. 
This is showbiz. <laughs> I just think it's pretty cool how you make that wheel spin. I thought that's what he was going to pull names out of a hat, but that's that's pretty wild. Congratulations, Sai. Well, perfect. I will direct message Sai if you could stay on and get your address and your t-shirt size. Um, but with that, we appreciate all of y'all being on here today. This recording will be posted on our YouTube channel later today. So if you want to watch it again or want to share it with anyone, we'll also be following up with a survey um, and an email if you would be able to complete that. It's very brief. Um, but it is a part of our grant and would help us out a lot if you can go through that form. Um, we'll stay on the call for a few more minutes if anyone wants to stay and ask a few more questions, but we will be doing another webinar next week as well as the following four weeks. It's a five-part series, um, and next week we will be talking about water management. Um, and does anyone else have any comments or questions? I do have one question. I don't know if um, one of the guys would be able to help help me out. Just kind of, I guess, maybe some advice. Uh, we're down. I'm down in southeast Louisiana, down uh, home of Thibodeau area, and the biggest thing we face is like we cut hay, and it, according to the uh, meteorologist, it's going to be a clear week, and then uh, all of a sudden, it just out of nowhere it just starts downpouring. Um, and I mean, it could rain for an hour and we'll get like five, probably five, six inches of rain. It seems like within that, uh, within that time, I'm just trying to figure out, like, I guess, I don't know if y'all faced sort of that problem as well. Cause, uh, like maybe I think you might've spoke, spoke on a little bit, like maybe, uh, bail it like a day earlier or just, pray it doesn't rain type situation. We, and we do square bales. We have uh, Arabian horses, so most of ours is, is square bales. And like I said, that's the biggest thing is just trying to make sure it's dry enough that where we can put it in our in our barn and we obviously don't, uh, they don't set on fire or whatever. But we also have the, the factor of the weather seems to be clear and then out of nowhere, we just get a pop-up thunderstorm. I don't know if y'all have any tips or advice to try to go around that. So when you're making horse hay, um, you definitely do want to shy away from making baleage for those guys. Um, now, one thing I've seen mostly out of guys making horse hay is you don't put it all down at once because then you can lose your entire crop to that one mm -hmm. pop-up thunderstorm. So spread it out. As far as horse quality hay, unless you got the youngsters, um, you know, we got Arabians as well. Um, they do fine on coarser, the mature hay. Okay. So, yeah. So that's plenty of days to work with there. Yeah, we we've tried to tried doing the uh, cutting it up, like splitting everything up. We got about thirty acres, and like I said we've tried splitting it up, cutting it up, and it's just like every time we try something new, it just like I said, just out of nowhere, rain rainstorm pops up, and it just downs everything so it's like well let's try just cutting everything at once and hopefully we can get every, get it all up at once and uh, the only other thing we've maybe tried looking into I know they have um, those uh, I think you could put them on your baler and like spray uh, like a chemical kind of helps with the molding I don't know if what would be the if that would be a good thing to maybe possibly invest in Yeah, actually it would. Now with horses, shy away from the propionic acid on uh, the hay because uh, the horses don't like that. Uh, now there are some products out there that will be, um, uh, a brand name of it would be uh, Silo Guard or Hay Guard. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically the same stuff that they use in uh, the canning industry to keep uh, fruit from turning brown. 
Uh, that will eliminate oxygen out of the hay. That's worked very well in hay I've seen. So that at least allow you to make hay that's on the damp side anyway. Okay. Yeah, like I said, that it's usually we'll be going through and it's like, okay, it's kind of hit or miss. And like I said, it when we start just I think uh yeah, just this earlier this week, we bailed like 153 of them. And right whenever we started accumulating, it started just downpouring and we couldn't save any of the bales. So it's it's <laughs> It's just where we're at, the humidity right along the coast. I mean, we get pop-up thunderstorms all the time, and it's it's just yeah. getting to the point of just praying. And it's like, man, somebody's got to have some kind of advice. And we've looked into the maybe just spraying it, give us maybe bail it like a day quicker or something like that. Yeah, John, I'll say, I mean, about all I can say is is, is I, I feel your pain, man. Um, it is – you are probably, in my opinion, you're in one of the, well, and, and we are too. I mean, it, you know, you're probably even worse though, but this is some of the hardest area, I think, to make dry hay. It's very, very challenging. Because uh, even if it's not, even if you don't get those pop-up thunderstorms, if, if the humidity is high enough, uh, the, the grass still doesn't, you know, the hay still doesn't completely cure. Um, and it was just a huge eye-opener to me coming from, you know, having made hay in the north where the air tends to be drier um, is a huge advantage. This is this is very, very challenging um, mm -hmm. to make, make dry hay. And I, I totally get where you're coming from. And I, I wish I wish I could sit here and say, oh, there's, you know, all you do is A, B, and C, and you can eliminate those problems, but you can't. It's, it's a reality that we have here. Um, and, and, you know, what Matt was saying there was some really good things to, to look at and, and just – trying to watch where you step and take those small bites and um but it can be it can be emotionally draining after a while to to um you know to fight with that weather forecast know what you mean yeah. oh definitely definitely but okay that's all i had so thank you Guys, David LeMay um, asked if you are irrigating your hay fields. Yes, we, we most of ours, uh, probably about two thirds of our pasture is, and, and hay ground is, is under irrigation. Um, you know, so it, it sounds like that would just eliminate all headaches, but it doesn't. Um, irrigation never replaces rainfall. Um, it basically, you know, it does help to kind of keep you in the game when uh, when things get dry and doesn't look like it's it's going to rain. It is a help, um, but we are you know it, it kind of becomes a logistical challenge too. Um, we use the pivots to cool our cattle in the summertime. So if we have you know if we're working across a particular circle uh, with the grazing rotation and we're cooling and we'll be there for a while. Uh, we can't irrigate on that circle while we're cooling there. So it kind of, you know, it, 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 it eliminates our ability to, to put on water exactly when we want to. Uh, but we, we try to just, you know, kind of a chess game, uh, managing all that stuff together. But, uh, but yeah, it is, it is a help. And we, we utilize the irrigation, um, you know, as much as we can. I, I was wondering, Matt or Ted, if you know, does the uh, the slight, the fermented hay, the, the wet hay, it's just kind of a newer concept in my brain to me. Is that better for the soil than dry hay being rolled out? Can't see there being any difference. I don't know what would be easier. I've never run rolled hay like that. I just didn't, you know, with gut health, fermented foods are better. So I didn't know if fermented hay is possibly better for the soil. Yeah, I don't know how the, you know, I don't know how the bacteria profile looks, at, you know, how that would look different, if it would look different. You know, one thing about, um, you know, silage hay, when it's unrolled on a sunny afternoon, if it's not consumed, it'll be dry hay before too long. Exactly. Um, you know, so 
um, you know, till it till it returns to the soil, it's I would think would be essentially the same. Makes sense. Yeah. What other questions do we have, guys? Well, just to give a, um, a little blurb, Louisiana Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative is who is uh, co-sponsoring this with national, funded by National Wildlife Federation. And we have an upcoming bus trip as well with Louisiana GLCI. And we're going to be going June 29th through July 1st over to Alabama. We have two pickup points, one in Alexandria and one in Winsboro to make a trip over to Alabama to the BDA farm. And Alan Williams, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Alan Williams from Understanding Ag, but he will be with us along the bus trip and be our tour guide to tell us all about what we're seeing on the farm, but also I'm sure to answer lots of questions. It's gonna be a lot of learning and a lot of good networking on that bus trip. And it's a very affordable trip. I believe it's uh, $300 for one person to go approximately and, um, and spouse tickets are less than that. And we also want to thank Ted and Matt. Ted runs Delta Dairy in Baskin, Louisiana. Um, and Matt, tell me the name of your, your consulting business again. I have forgotten. Innovative Dairy Nutrition. Innovative Dairy, dairy Nutrition. And I'm actually on Matt's calendar for not a dairy consult, but a beef cattle consult coming up soon for our farm um, to help us learn how to grass finish beef a little bit better and have a better understanding of nutrition that we can do. So we're excited to meet with you on that, Matt, when you're in Louisiana. And he does come to Louisiana um, pretty often. I think you said about once a month, right? Once a month. Okay. So um, do you, would you like to give us your contact info, Matt? Yes, uh, cell phone's the easiest way. Uh, my cell phone number and text messages is 717-729-4530. Do you have a website also? I do. Uh, and it's www.innovativedairynutrition.com. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. How long have you and Ted been working together? I first stopped there April of two years ago. Okay. Yeah, I mean, a little kind of a funny story about that. You know, Matt stopped by and, you know, of course, you know, and Matt knows all about this. He, he, he stops at dairies all the time. Those guys are always busy. They're always doing something. And dairy guys have a way of being able to pick out salesmen when they're coming. And they, they know. So anyway, we happened to be working bees that day, weren't, weren't doing dairy work. And Matt pulls in, I never saw him before. And I thought, okay, well, I mean, you know, I want to talk to this guy, but we can't today. And I try to be polite about that, you know? And so he leaves and I look at his card and I'm like, Willow Hill, Pennsylvania. I mean, of all places, that's where I came from. What in the world's he doing down here? Uh, so as we get to talking, you know, we know a lot of the same people and, you know, he literally will come down here and like, the week before he was visiting like people that were my neighbors when I was growing up in Pennsylvania. And now he's you know, visiting me, which just blows my mind. Uh, but it was kind of, I'm, I'm so glad Matt stopped. And uh, you know, like he does a lot of times when he stops, guys are busy and doesn't have a chance to talk, but we had an opportunity to, uh, to hook back up. And that was uh, uh, our relationship has been, it's been a very valuable thing for, for our farm. So I'm very thankful for it. And uh thankful for his his expertise and guidance we've gotten over the years did he have to put on a bee suit to visit with you that day no no we we uh no. if, if he would have been uh like some guys are you know who don't want to you know you know Matt's pretty good he knows when you're busy he gives you a card he said okay well, well you know some guys don't leave uh and if he wouldn't have left we'd have put a bee suit on him took him to the bee yard but uh well he just gave me his card and we were able to we were able to catch up without uh without that complication. So it was, it was good. And all this time, I thought y'all were old friends from Pennsylvania. I completely missed that story. 
never knew him up there. Never knew him up there. Know a lot of the same yep. people, but never met him up there. Well, well I think we will kind of conclude the call, but we appreciate everyone being here today and hope to see y'all for our upcoming webinars and on our bus tour. Um, thank you so much. And I hope you'll have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you guys. Thank you very much.